So today we want to learn about adiabatic heating and adiabatic cooling. But before we can do that, we need to learn about the first law of thermodynamics. The first law of thermodynamics simply says energy cannot be created or destroyed. It can only change forms. And I'd like you to think about that like a cup of tea and flavor. So pretend that energy is flavor. What would happen to the flavor of the tea if I took some fire and boiled my tea? What's going to happen to the flavor as the tea evaporates? The flavor is going to get stronger. It's not going to just disappear. It's going to get stronger as the tea gets smaller. The amount of tea in my cup gets smaller, smaller, and smaller. And, and I'm not actually dumping in any flavoring. It's just that if the volume of the D tea decreases, the flavor is going to increase. But the amount of flavor really is just staying the same. And the same would be true if I took some water. And if I take this water, if I add it to the tea, I want you to think about what's going to happen to the flavor. It's going to get weaker, even though the amount of flavoring isn't changing. I'm not somehow taking flavor out of this jar. So the first law of thermodynamics and adiabatic heating and cooling has to do with the closed system. So when I add water to this, it gets weaker, but the flavor, the amount of flavor is still the same. Now let's talk about adiabatic cooling. Suppose I have a body of air and it's contained. There's going to be a certain amount of actual heat energy, actual temperature in that air. If I expand the volume of air, don't add any heat or take away any heat, that heat is going to be stretched thin or diluted if you're thinking about it as like flavoring. And as it stretches thin, the amount of heat isn't going to change, but the temperature of that body of air is going to change. A great example is compressed air. There's a certain amount of air inside this can and it has a certain temperature. And as I release air out of the can, the amount of air inside the can is decreasing. And as that amount of air inside decreases, the amount of temperature, the temperature of the can decreases as well. It gets colder. So what happens to air? As it expands, if no heat is getting in, and our heat is trying to get in through the side of this can, and it's somewhat succeeding, no heat's getting in, temperature is going to decrease. And if you have a can of compressed air, um, the outside of the can can get very cold. In fact, um, it can get so cold that frost starts to build up on the outside of the can. It's exactly how a cloud forms. Air that's compressed by atmospheric pressure starts to rise. As it rises, it expands. And as it expands, the temperature goes down. Eventually, the temperature decreases so much that it hits dew point, and all the water vapor that's in that air that's expanding eh, starts to condense and it condenses on little tiny droplets called condensation nuclei. If you've ever taken a water bottle and twisted it up and tried to shoot off the cap, um, you might have noticed that there's a little bit of steam that comes out the end of the water bottle. It's not smoke, it's steam or water vapor because the compressed air suddenly expands and as it expands, it cools to dew point and it the water droplets condense on condensation nuclei. Great way to demonstrate this is to take a two liter um, bottle. I just have a, a, a gallon of water here and uh, it's empty. 
you want to add a little bit of water to your gallon jug. You're going to put the lid on, swirl it around a little bit, um, and that's creating water vapor. You want to add just the tiniest bit of smoke to create some condensation nuclei for some, some nucleating um, spots for water vapor to form. So just um, ignite a little piece of paper, drop it into your jug, um, and it'll go out because there's water in the bottom of the jug. Make sure that there's no, uh, you can put some oxygen in there. You're gonna put the lid on, and it's exactly the same as the twisty the bottle thing. Press the bottle, and uh, eventually, as the pressure builds up, if you want to get extreme pressure, you're going to squeeze that bottle, and the air is going to be compressing, 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 and then eventually, you're going to release the pressure. When you release the pressure, um, that air that's inside this bottle is going to expand. As it expands, it cools, and if it reaches dew point, you should see some steam or some cloud coming out the end of the bottle. The exact same thing happens with a cloud. The air is rising up. As it rises, it expands because there's less pressure. And as it expands, it cools because of adiabatic cooling. Eventually that cooling reaches dew point, condenses, and creates visible water droplets, which we call as clouds. Now let's talk about adiabatic heating. Um, and if you've ever taken a bicycle pump and you started pumping away, you're compressing the air and the air is getting compressed um, it actually transfers some of that heat uh, from the compression to the needle. And you can feel on the needle and you'll feel some of that heat from um, the bicycle pump. Now, all the things I've been showing you so far are relatively cheap. 50 cents for a water bottle, can of compressed air will last you like a couple of years and you can get it for a couple bucks at Staples. This device is awesome. It's called a fire syringe and you can get it for about $10 on Carolina Science. Um, basically, um, it's just a tube with plunger, and um, we're gonna put a little bit of cotton. You kinda have to experiment with the amount of cotton you know, to be oxygenated, not too rolled tightly. You're gonna um, push that into the bottom of the syringe, use a pen or something, and uh, if you have some left over, you can use like a paper clip to try to get it out. Um, you're going to put the plunger on the top, like this, and um, screw it down. And this is adiabatic heating. So right now, inside this tube, there's a certain amount of air, and most of it is at 70 degrees um, Fahrenheit, a certain amount of heat. Um, and when I push on this plunger, it's going to take all that heat that was, now, that was spread out, it's going to decrease the amount, the volume of the air, pressurizing it. And um, as it does that, it's going to cause the air to heat up. Um, and the ignition point of cotton is somewhere close to 250 degrees Fahrenheit. Um, and if it works, we should get um, some fire in the bottom of this tube. If you purchase one, it does take a little bit of practice um, and you do have to strike the top pretty hard to get some fire um, at the bottom of this tube. So this is adiabatic heating. We're compressing the air, and um, as it, air compresses, it heats up. Um, and inside a tube like this, it can heat up to the ignition point of cotton. Um, you wanna make sure you're on a pretty sturdy surface. So here we go. Did you see it? We'll try to get a close up here. Um, the air is compressing and it heats up to the ignition point of cotton. For $10, every science teacher needs to have a fire syringe in their closet. And um, I like to get the students out to plunge it and try it themselves. Um, this is the exact same principle 
as a diesel engine. There's no spark plugs in a diesel engine. Um, it's compressed. As it compresses, um, it heats up adiabatically, heating the diesel fuel to ignition, and um, that's what runs your diesel engine. If you have um, a wind like a phone or a Chinook um, in the Rocky Mountains, the air is coming over the mountain. As it comes over the mountain, slides down the bottom of the mountain, it's going to get compressed because of atmospheric pressure. As it compresses, it's going to warm because of adiabatic heating and um, it creates a very warm wind, sometimes nicknamed the snow eaters because it comes down over a mountain, compresses, heats up, and uh, will just melt snow in a couple minutes. So I hope you kind of learned what adiabatic heating and cooling is. Hopefully it makes a little bit more sense to you. It's how clouds form, it's how diesel engines work, um, and hopefully you can use some of these demonstrations in your class. Um, and if you're a student, I hope you have a better handle on what adiabatic heating and adiabatic cooling is. Um, if you like this video and would like to see more content like this, please uh, subscribe to my channel, uh, share this video, comment below if you have any um, concepts that you would like to see explained in a future video. Thank you.